the rain. All right, we're going live right now. So uh, welcome everyone. This is the uh, workshop for the Scarborough Town Council. It's Wednesday, February 15th, uh, 6 o'clock. Today's conversation is regarding the 
uh, discussion on the Gorham East-West Corridor. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our manager, Tom Call, for introductions and uh, overview, I guess. Great. Um, yeah, I became involved in this back in 2008 on my take from this position. Uh, there was great progress made for a couple of years there, and we've been kind of in the doldrums for a couple of years. And this is really exciting project, I think, very important to Scarborough and, and Gorham in particular. Uh, the impacts are massive right now. North Scarborough is an area of town. And if I get to there during the morning rush or evening rush, uh, it's really impossible. It's only going to be worse. So what we'd like to do is, um, is to bring new counselors, introduce this idea to you, bring ones uh, that knew something about this previously, back up the speed, if you will. Uh, no action is in front of you this evening, but should it be, uh, should it go well this evening, we'd like to bring the resolve that was provided part of the packet uh, to you at your next meeting for your consideration. So with that, we do have representatives from the main turf with Pike Authority here this evening. And Peter, do you want to start introducing sure. yourself? Sure. I'm Peter Mills, and this, I'm the executive director and Sarah is the Garfos as our planning. And she does probably more evening work than anyone else at the Turnpike. And if she likes, she stays, one of her jobs is to stay current with municipalities. We have about 24 or 25 municipalities that we pass through, and in, in some cases we're I like the Turnpike is a, is a highly divisive uh, piece of infrastructure, and we uh, like to stay on good terms with both sides of the towns that we split. <laughs> it's a, quite a challenge. But um, in this case, um, way back in 07, the legislature had invited us to, and the DOT, to jointly conduct a study about what to do with traffic congestion that attempts to get from so basically South Gorham to uh, to this area or to the turnpike at, at exit 45 and we we it was actually a joint resolve that had um, had had us also look at east-west traffic down to Sanford from the turnpike to Sanford and the DOT paid for 80 percent of that study we paid for 20 percent and then we paid for 80 percent of this study up here and the DOT paid for 20%. And the towns have contributed substantial amounts of in-kind attention to this project, but we've not asked them to spend any money on it, directly anyway. Um, but there was a tremendous amount of work done, and Sarah uh, was our lead person on all of that work. And the report came to fruition. And then it... I came to the Turnpike in 2011, just before the report was issued. Um, and one of the things we did shortly after the report was finalized was to inquire of the... Uh, I want to have Sarah go through some of the findings of the report, but basically it said you've got two, from a, from a transportation perspective, there are, from an automobile transportation perspective, there are two, two solutions to this congested area out here. And the congested area isn't just Outer Congress Street and 114 and, and 25. It is, it is Running Hill Road. It is a lot of the roads that are Spring Street. There's a lot of the roads that, are, that are people are using in various creative ways <laughs> to get from the Sebago Lake region and other areas out west into places like the Main Mall and the city of Portland. And they're not all going to the same place. And so I mean, there is a certain amount of sprawl to the problem, and, but there are sort of two fundamental ways of addressing it. One is to take the existing arteries and just, start, just keep building turning lanes and, and travel lanes and make them into something that looks maybe a lot like Route 302 or Route 202 up in, in, in Route 4 going out of Auburn, uh, Route 2 going west from Farmington and Wilton. Take a perf take, widen it out so that you've got a road that is, doesn't know what it is, whether it's a throughway or it's a destination road, you wind up with confused traffic, a lot of deaths, and, uh, and continued congestion and, and unpleasantness. The other solution, um, and that would be a DOT solution since the turnpike would have no capacity for dealing with it. The other solution is to consider a limited access highway, perhaps from the Gorham uh, uh, circular, um, roundabout 
this, the three-quarter roundabout down there in 114, and then come across country, and strangely enough, there is an awful lot of open country. Uh, it would take remarkably few houses, and then try to connect up, come up, fly over Congress Street, or maybe with an interchange, and come up and pick up the turnpike at exit 45, which then raises some interesting challenges about, well, do we like 45 the way it is today? Because if you're going to rebuild it, <coughs> it raises an interesting challenge for South Portland to begin telling us what they would like 45 to look like because there's a lot going on there. Um, people are flying off in di very different directions. And it raises issues about, well, what is the future of the main mall? Is Mason still going to be there? I mean, there's a host of, of future future-like projections and speculations you can make about what happens. <coughs> in any case, we did a quick study of it and decided that, you know, for somewhere between a dollar and two dollars, you could put a toll on this five-mile strip of road and pay for it. Pay for it. It's about a hundred and, somewhere between a hundred and a hundred and twenty-five million dollar project, probably. And there was, we've been, had internal debates about whether it ought to be one lane each way or two. Uh, you certainly would buy the right of way to accommodate two each way, but do you build it? And then how would you toll it? My view is it ought to be probably entirely electronic. Um, and uh, anyway, the corridor is something that was Sarah discussed and the, and the committee discussed it with. And the corridor is fairly evident. And then the question is, well, what, what are going to be the impacts of that corridor? Is it going to rescue how much of these how much of these other roads will they, in fact, rescue from whatever fate they're heading toward right now, which is <coughs> basically gridlock. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we've asked HMTB, our concern. We, we put a, a letter into the Army Corps of Engineers and said, would you relieve us if we applied for a permit to build this road? Would you relieve us from having to burden you with an alternatives analysis about the other solution, which is widening all of the other roads that are under congested conditions? Because they will ask us, to, because that would avoid doing a lot of the wetland impacts that, that our highways would impose. There would be a fair amount of wetland. And, and if you've got another way of solving the problem, they, they, their rules require that you do an alternatives analysis. But that alternative is not one that the turnpike, at least, as it would be capable of addressing. So we said, can you possibly relieve us of having to go through that exercise of looking at, at, at and ruling out all of this other stuff that, we, that, frankly, the involved communities and most people don't want to do, let alone facing the, the fact that the DOT has limited resources with which to execute. And the answer is, no, you've got to continue looking. We got an equivocal answer out of the core, and, and uh, it took about a year and a half to get the answer that we got it. And then I began looking at the statute and realized that we really don't have the authority to build this way. Um, I think we were operating under the assumption that we did. And you could stretch the language to suggest that we do, but I don't think we could put any bonds on it. Uh, but the bond... The banking community likes to have definite language uh, to support whatever you're trying to do. And so I thought, well, let's bring it to a head. So Sarah and I and Bruce drafted up a, a legislative change to our Enabling Act that's being sponsored by area legislators, and it will be coming up for hearing in March. And it basically says that the turnpike is authorized to go build this connector. And uh, where, and I, one of the good things about that is that it will draw out if there is controversy over this, and there may well be. Um, it will draw it out. It maybe has the effect of drawing it out. And uh, my board is just a seven-member board that's appointed by the governor. And you go to them and, and you say, you know, do you want to build this or not? I mean, their attitude is, well, maybe somebody should tell us. And if the legislature tells us, then it solves their political problem about whether they should be doing, engaging in this or not. And uh, they're having to do it. It's just, they're not, they're not elected. 
I'm it just, you know, they're administrators, and, and so am I. And uh, it's a little, it's much more helpful if we have some politicians saying, yep, this is where we want you to go. And uh, so I I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I stole any, Sarah's done some homework on this, and I thought maybe I ought to ask her to speak a little more in depth about it. Well, you gave, a, I mean, obviously a very thorough um, and of the history and where we are today and kind of like what we're going to be asking of you folks for the legislative support with the resolve that Tom has um, circulated. I have put together some slides of um, some more details of what the study found um, and I'm happy to go through them if you'd like to do that <coughs> or we can get more and in, in, do more of where we are currently if you would like well, to I suggest you move through them quickly and I can go yeah, quick because the scope of what they looked at is quite interesting I mean we looked at rail buttons mm -hmm. I mean I mean it, any, it, any kind of proposal that people mm -hmm. came up with sure. bicycles <laughs> and please, if there are questions along the way, don't hesitate to stop and ask. So Peter covered the history, and this has been um, the discussion of a westerly connection from the greater Portland area or west has been going on since like the 70s. So this is really nothing new. It's just um, trying to get this to come to fruition. So uh, real quickly, this is the general study area, um, and you can t see that there's a darker orange, and these are the four municipalities that were involved with Scarborough, Gorham, Westbrook, and South Portland, the lighter orange communities did participate yeah. in the study analysis and um, giving feedback on um, some of the alternatives. So the problem really came um, about because of the traffic congestion and the mobility issues in the region. So the traffic counts that we used were from 2008 to 2009. And although we have not updated those counts, we do know that traffic on the turnpike has increased um, significantly since that time, and we could only surmise that that would be the case within the study region as well. So the traffic issues that we were um, looking at were the annual daily traffic counts of over 18,000 in three two-lane locations, seven intersections that were at a level of service or of E and F, which is failing, um, 64 high crash locations and customer feedback, um, you can't get there, it's scary, people are using my street for cut throughs, things like that. Have any of those intersections been redone? I know they redid spring and yeah. out of Congress, but... Um, of the high, of the... Of the seven. I don't know that, but I am part of the work that we are doing is updating this which we can talk a little bit about after. And I will put that as a question for HNTB. Um, yeah, how many, have, given the study that was done in 2011 as well, has anything changed? I think, I mean, in Scarborough, there's been some modest improvements, but I think part of the issue here is that no town can solve this issue, and DOT and municipalities have been reluctant to invest significant dollars thinking that this might, this might be the solution. Uh, so. There was a left turn lane added from 114 on the Running Hill Road oh, yeah. by DOT. That was a safety improvement. Again, not a big improvement, but a, a modest one. I think Gorham has done some modest improvements in the South Gorham area. And I think <coughs> what you would find is that those modest improvements would have to be done regardless if a connector was built because right. the study did find that even a connector alone wouldn't answer all the problems and that there were some localized intersections and things like that that would have to be improved as well. But I'll make sure to include those intersections on um, HNTV's work that they do. So Dave, Dan, I have a question. So we're looking at a Gorham, Hill, Gorham Road infrastructure improvement, right? Um, would this impact that at all or adjust our plans for that? Or would we would do, I know we would do that whether there's a connector or not because there's not one there now. <coughs> would that affect our improvements there? Meaning would we scale th that back or would we still move forward with? I think if the Gorham Road project was west of the turnpike, I would <coughs> say yes. But since the Gorham Road project is on the east side of Payne Road, it's really not related to most of this traffic movement. Oh, yeah. Because um, we're looking from Oak Hill up to E. Corners Payne Road. Yep. Yep. Most of this traffic is, if it's coming down Gorham Road, it's hitting Payne Road, and then it's going towards the mall. You know, it's really that. And we're not looking at widening. We're just looking at uh, reallocating space type of thing or improving the... We're looking at widenings here and there, but not, again, not... 
close to where this is trying to solve the, the regional traffic issues, really kind of west of the turnpike versus east. So we're not worried about feeding more traffic into that congested area, uh, let's say west of Pleasant Hill Road, or I mean, not Pleasant Hill Road. Uh, I think this is attempting to take okay. traffic okay. off of Gorham Road, okay. off of Running yeah. Hill Road. Our improvements will do nothing to expand the vehicular access. Capacity. There's no additional capacity being built in. It's really okay. a safer pedestrian. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Drainage. Yeah. Yeah. So the the study um, proposed to evaluate future growth projections for the region, and we used Charlie Colgan. Uh, the, at, he was at the time the state economist, and he developed these projections for 2035. And as you can see, the uh, the population projection was 27 percent within the region, jobs was 16 percent, and dwelling units um, was 30 percent increase over 2009 numbers. So then the question was, where were all those dwelling units going to be going within the region? And we did an exercise where we kind of allocated them throughout the region. And we took a look at the history of growth for municipalities. So this is Scarborough. Um, these next couple slides are going to go over the last 90 years or so. And where these, are, <coughs> these little dots are residential buildings. Um, little red dots, blue dots are non-residential buildings. So over the, that was um, 25, 25, 75, mm -hmm. 70, mm -hmm. this 75, next 25 years. This is 2000, 2010. God. So, uh, sorry, quick question. Um, where's the connector on that? It's not. Are okay. uh, the proposed connector? No, 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 no. The Scarborough connector off the turnpike because oh, um, I'm seeing the orange lines coming down through, but I don't see anything off the turnpike. I have to go back. Sorry, is it right there? It should be in there. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's it, right, right there. That is it. Yep. Yeah. Well, the orange oh. line. Yes. Yeah. So this is this the connector. Correct. Yes. The existing one. Looking for your house. No, no, no. I'm looking for the, I'm looking for the connection on to the direct connection of the turnpike because you get on the connector. There's an off ramp there that's a B line, basically right to yeah the orange the, line the, that goes the A. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yes, that parallels the town line. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hmm. So um, it was determined that just over 6,500 new units would have to be absorbed in the town of Scarborough for 2035. To 2035. So that brings us there. So what the next step was? What were those units, and what was that growth going to do to the already strained transportation network? So this this map just shows um, the the bubble on the left is well, it was current then, 2009, and then it goes to 2035 level of service. So you can see that several of your intersections. Some are, oh sorry, <coughs> my button's up. Some stay the same, but like right here, it goes from a C to an F. This is a B to an F, um, a C to an E. <coughs> Some stay the same, but you have an A to an F along the running, uh, along 114. Um, you have a D to an F, a lot of Fs in there, and there are currently Fs in there. So then the question that the congestion worsens with this growth, obviously. The high crash locations increase. 23 intersections are at level of service ERF com compared to the seven. 14 miles of roadway are at ERF. That's quadrupling from the three miles. And then vehicle hours traveled are growing faster than vehicle miles traveled. So people are spending twice as much time in their car to get the same distance. And then the impact, the local impact is traffic is changing neighborhoods. There become, like Peter had mentioned, creative cut-throughs on local streets. The congestion is causing people to take more risks to get out into traffic. There's like impatient driving habits. Comprehensive plans um, are seeking, we're seeing more and more to have a village setting. And this kind of congestion really isn't conducive to that. As you see in this picture, you have houses on one side of the street and businesses on the other with four or five lanes of road in between. Um, and then the livability and quality of life is reduced. So the study really took um, into consideration three prong, a three-pronged approach to deal with these congestion issues. It was kind of the first time um, that we had used this approach of looking at land use changes, transit um, changes, and what roadway improvements had to be done. 
So first we looked at land use and it was determined that it would really be um, beneficial in, to the network and to the transit opportunities if we had little nodes of development, which I believe Dan has been working on with PACs to some degree. There was a need to preserve transportation capacity and quality of life. Uh, we identified those growth areas. There was incent we wanted to incentivize with higher densities to <coughs> make the transit options more feasible. Um, this needed to be implemented at the municipal level, but it was identified that PACS was really the um, organization that could help do that. And I believe PACS did um, move on forward and um, Goreboro was, is that the, the well, term? I didn't choose the name. I know <laughs> you didn't choose it. I know you didn't choose it. It, it came out of a workshop. PACS because South Gorham and North Scarborough mm. share a lot of things, including congestion, but also the land use dynamics there. So we spent a good deal of time looking at the zoning in both places to try to coordinate them. Um, but it, it was a really tough discussion with the neighborhood because they don't want to talk about mm -hmm. development or zoning. They want to talk about traffic congestion relief. So um, we had to kind of get as far as we could with that discussion. Yeah but then really bring it back to before we can do much planning or much, you know, um, entertain much development proposals, there needs to be a decision made around, okay, is there going to be a widening, which is a big character changer for that area to 114 or 22, or is there this other alternative? Um, and so the study really kind of got at the issue of character and how most of the residents there did not want 114 and 22 to become a Route 1. You know, that like a four-lane section versus a two-lane section, not surprisingly. So that really is suggesting that, you know, this alternative alignment is, from their perspective, really the only option if congestion is going to be relieved. So, um, and Dan's right. Those were difficult discussions. We had several meetings at the Grange Hall, which was right in the heart of where that congestion happens on a daily basis. And, you know, Dan and, and Tom and other folks had put together these beautiful visioning boards, but it was almost impossible for folks to get beyond mm -hmm. this traffic is here. You know, we can't build five unit buildings with all this traffic. So, and it was hard. It's also difficult because a lot of that traffic isn't destined for either one of those municipalities. Right, so so I, I think, Mr. Mills, you made a great comment at, at Gorham a few weeks ago about, you, you know, what do we want the goal to be here? Do we want this road to be a, a feeder for local businesses to bring traffic to a destination, or do we want this to be a pass-through corridor that basically moves commuters through the area as quickly as possible? Did this land use coordination study address those issues and we're beyond that now and moving forward, or would we need to do another study again to determine that before we move forward with the, with the corridor adjustments? The study did not address what we want, mm -hmm. but it addressed what options we have. Okay. And it also said, let's look first, if we make these changes to land use, what are our capacity needs then? And then it said, okay, we have these changes which we can service, we can have transit options that service these land use changes, which then what are our capacity issues? And then it got, so that's the transit side. Even with the boat most optimal transit scenario, we were only going to get 6% reduction. And these were the alternative solutions to the connector corridor that the, D, that the Army Corps So requested. we looked at all of this and then, then, even with all of those changes, which we felt were pretty aggressive, yep. we still <coughs> needed capacity. So even if you build high density neighborhoods and you have a, you know, the most robust transit system, you still need additional capacity, roadway capacity. So then it becomes your question of which one is it going to be? Yeah. So the first option is additional highway capacity, widen existing roadways. So you see that you're going to have you're going to have some sort of localized bypass. 114 is going to get widened to, we, I mean, we don't know exactly, but at least four lanes, um, which makes a stop and go condition, as we all know, challenging in commuter time. Um, there would be some sort of local connection to the, the um, two, 295 corridor here, maybe a, a localized bypass up in Westbrook, 
and some other intersection improvements. So this is one option that the study concluded that was a, it was an option. So the pros was that there was likely less wetland and habitat impact and lower initial cost. The cons is that this is going to potentially erode villages and neighborhoods. There was no viable funding source and the improved mobility would probably be lost over time. Um, we call it kind of kicking the can down the road, that eventually there's going to need additional capacity over that. Is, is it safe to say that the towns themselves individually would shoulder the burden of these costs? The, the towns or the DOT, yeah, and they would be very in, incremental. It's not like right. all of those things would be done in in like one construction. No, right, I mean, because what would happen was the the conditions would get so bad that the DOT, the safety conditions, um, the mobility conditions would get so bad that the Department of Transportation and or the town and or PAC would have to do something. And it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. And, the, and this alternative, at least from planning perspective, the mobility is not nearly as optimal mm -hmm. because of all the access points. I mean, 114, there's still going to be properties along 114 mm -hmm. That new driveway is at the high end of the roadway <coughs> every 200 feet. So think about driving on Route 1 versus about driving on the turnpike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're interrupted all the time driving on Route 1 because of those access points where the limited access highway is, has a lot better mobility. Um, because Carver is so affected by this option, though there's a number of improvements, but the 114 improvement is, is all us. Mm -hmm. We really insisted that kind of the social cost and consequence of that option be evaluated. And that was a bit of a, I would say we got pushback, but it was a bit further afield than they wanted to go. But uh, there's a huge impact. Um, I don't know how many dozens of houses that mm. are Too close taken. To the road. Yeah. They're close enough to the road that another lane with that would show them. It would be significant. And there are some businesses along there that there would be significant impact. I know that O'Donnell's, um, the VIP, there's a church that would have some event, event areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that um, really, what to Tom's point, really plays into the impact that the municipality can have on the permitting process too, because the permitting process is forced to look at things like municipalities' comprehensive plans. And if there's a clear message in your comprehensive plan that says, we don't want this section of our town to be a pass-through, four lanes, we want it to be more of a village, then they can't ignore that. The permitting agencies have to consider those social impacts. So the other alternative, um, this is the blo a large blob map, but as Peter mentioned, that it um, would most likely go to the terminus or the beginning of the roundabout um, in Gorham, the first roundabout, to the turnpike on exit 45. And the reason exit 45 is that gave the best access to the turnpike 295 and Route 1 for folks using this corridor. Again. So, so sorry. I was just saying, again, Scarborough plays prominently in that option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the land between yeah. those yep. two points is right. Right. So, um, part of that would problem. that redesign of exit 45 include anything, I guess, east of that, which is the connector to Route 1 direct and then the Scarborough connector spur as well? Would you look at redesigning that, or would it basically be the tie in from the westerly side and accommodating that increased flow? Well, we have to look, I mean, from the turnpike's perspective, currently, we have to look at exit 45 mm -hmm. regardless of mm -hmm. what happens because we are upgrading our toll equipment and this, that's one of the last ones to be done because it's, it has that going on, it has a bridge that needs to be raised. And <coughs> um, But I think that when that time came, I think we would take the opportunity to kind of look at other, I don't know that we'd go all the way up to the connection to Route 1, but you do have to look at what happens when you dump traffic mm. right there. Right. So I think we would have to look at that. We have a corporate interest in this, and this is one of the reasons that we've sort of precipitated this to get sort of, I mean the question we have is are we going to be asked to build this or not because we have got to make some changes to 45, the tolling equipment needs to come out, and, and there's, there are things we ought to do and then she said there's a bridge to be replaced. And how we do that depends on whether there's going to be a connection to the west or not. Right. So we sort of need an answer. That's one reason 
uh, my board and I want, and the staff, we want an answer as to whether we're going to be tasked with this or not. And as I said to anybody that wants to hear it, we're merely an instrumentality. We're available. This is within our capacity to do financially and from an engineering point of view, but if people don't want it, if there's some reason that the legislature says, no, we don't want to build it, we want you to consider other alternatives, I guess that's why we're trying to bring it to a political head. Mm -hmm. Sure, and I guess I'm looking at it from a Scarborough perspective of if that connector is also going to be improved or changed, that's another impact on Scarborough, not necessarily on that main corridor, but that's now something east of the turnpike that we have to take into consideration as well. Right. That's where the land use conversation comes in, uh, right. where interchanges are located, um, right. be critical. <coughs> and we're happy to sort of oversee the planning process that, that does look at those impacts. That's within our capacity to do. We can hire the engineering firms to help look at it and hold meetings with people. And we're happy about it, to host that as right. part of this large project. And where would PACS fall <coughs> into that mix at all? Would that be uh, something outside, once we get outside your purview, to look at well, I think there's, I don't know, you know with PACS there. and GP COG as a regional planning organization have a key role to play sure. not only in thinking about transportation but thinking about the zoning and land use when you introduce a connector because all of a sudden Buxton and Hollis and Standish are easy destinations. Ten minutes to the highway or last versus 30. Right. So... That's a key component in terms of how the region grows, and I think there's um, many who are thinking about that aspect who want to make sure if this happens that that aspect is being talked about and planning is in place so that there aren't these other consequences. Right. And what, I mean, the Standish component certainly has done some work to, to have that planning in place. They right. have worked, they were working um, even prior to the study beginning to have some growth kind of regulator type smart growth initiatives in place that would be supportive of this type of initiative. But also, um, we want to make sure on the turnpike perspective as well that we can receive this traffic. So we are looking at additional capacity that's needed on our main line to, to accommodate this prior to this being built. We need, we're looking at that now. We probably have some needs now to have additional capacity, but we would want to make sure that was in place prior to this being open. So the pros for the, the, pros for the new connector, um, there's a viable funding source for the turnpike. It provides increased and sustainable mobility. It separates the, true, the through traffic from the local traffic, preserves the village and neighborhoods, and um, location has some flexibility. Um, wh where it's going across the country. <coughs> the cons is there's a higher initial capital cost and potentially more wetland and habitat impact. And I just want to qualify that with we're not talking three acres versus 30 acres. We're talking more like three acres versus seven acres. Yeah. So yeah. it's not an enormous uphill battle um, permitting wise. It's really critical to have um, a very thoughtful purpose statement approved by the Army Corps because that is what they would evaluate all your alternatives against. So to have things like um, separated traffic, you know, local traffic, through traffic, to take into consideration the, um, the, the character of the neighborhood and the fabric of the community, those are important things to have in the purpose statement. So for the environmental impact, if you're talking offsets or things like that, would that be the town's responsibility to establish that or would DOT, I mean, uh, 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 the would, would do that? Okay. Part of the cost of the Okay. Yeah. And that's all part of that alternative. Okay. But they would use our local comprehensive plan as a guide mm -hmm. and direct in that statement and those considerations, right? Right. We would use, definitely want to use that as a tool. Um, this legislative resolve and the, le the bill that is going to be heard and this um, legislative session will be a tool, um, and then just the the, <coughs> the traffic management and how the traffic moves will speak for itself too. So Sarah, has the Turnpike looked at the longevity of the widening proposal versus the longevity of the connector in terms of environmental impact? Like if you say 114 has to be widened to four lanes, right? how long that lasts, so yeah. then you widen again, yeah. and maybe you're not counting the second widening in your comparison for wetland fills, right. because uh, potentially you're widening earlier 
if you're yeah, and Redbrook in particular yeah, meanders yeah. and touches almost right. touches 114 today. So there will be a number of potential impacts. Okay. So, so that's just something to think about. After the study concluded, we did a quick kind of environmental analysis because th this study didn't really look at environmental issues or constraints or opportunities or anything like that. And so um, we looked at that really quick, but we didn't look at the longevity issue. I think in the next phase, because even if this passes through the legislature, we're still going to have to do an alternative sure. analysis with the Army Corps. So those types of things certainly, because in the purpose statement, it will hopefully say sustainable. And <laughs> that will be have to show that. So it will be a good way to bring those issues to the forefront. So um, the next step, uh, the MTA, I, I believe, is going to take the sole lead on this. Um, as Peter met, mentioned, there is a bill in the uh, legislature right now. Um, we will want to continue working with our um, partners at permitting agencies. We do have a draft project <coughs> purpose statement that we have submitted to them. Uh, I'm happy to circulate it to the group. Um, it does talk about things like sustainability, um, long-term mobility, um, the, the character of the community, getting people through traffic to the turnpike, to connections to the east, and then uh, re-engage with our partners that have been really the bread and butter of this process. Um, I can't say enough about the staff from the municipalities that worked mm. a lot on this. Dan and I were saying we don't really see each other anymore because <laughs> there's no Gorham East West Quarter meetings. But um, maybe when Gorham incorporates or, or yeah, yeah. Gorbro, when Gorbro incorporates. Yeah. The, the, no. last, the last time our council touched this issue, although we had a couple of reports through the intervening years, was back in February 2008. You authorized the manager to enter into a, on your behalf, a memorandum of understanding with those four core communities. Yes. Uh, which basically gave rise to the phase one study that is there and Peter walked us through. But now being asked of us to kind of re-engage the partners is to consider passing this resolve. Uh, the other three committees are being asked to do the same thing too. Already have, is that correct? Uh, Gorham has, and South Portland I think is in the process of. And all of that would be a, a real necessary precursor to the bill being heard in hearing. It's, it's, it's essential to supporting the bill, I think, to have. It, that, it's so unusual to have, it would be, I mean, to have four communities. We can almost in, include Standish. I mean, they're practically a fifth partner. They were so interested in this. Although they're not on the corridor as such, they're fed to. That's the timing of this and what we'd be asked of next if you're receptive to it. Sometime in March, the bill will be up for public hearing. I'll work with the chairman. I'd love to schedule it as soon as your next meeting, if, if you wish. So, so would the memorandum of understanding run parallel to the first one or similar yeah, structure? It's been exhausted. It's kind of no, it right. served its, its purpose. In fact, we had negotiated a second memorandum of understanding. That's what it's it. And when we were talking about kind of what the next step was, and it really is, as Peter mentioned, to get a pr approval and authority for the turnpike to build such a road, we thought the best really <coughs> avenue or vehicle to get that support was through this um, resolve. And then I, I anticipate that before we go into our next step of um, our, our alternative analysis, we will draft a new memorandum of yeah. agreement that then will have roles and responsibilities. Um, it just seemed a little cumbersome to do it and for, for this. Yeah. If they can't get the legislative mandate authority, uh, right. authority um, we're dead in the water. Right, we are. Just so I'm clear, that MOA would come back to the council for approval, sure. correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Can I ask a uh, kind of mechanical question? Like you, you mentioned the clearing that corridor, there aren't many houses that are impacted, mm -hmm. but w what are the mechanics there? Is that just take it by eminent domain? I mean, how does the, the, the turnpike? The turnpike has, a, has the capacity to take houses or property by eminent domain. Um, we seldom do it. We usually do it by bargaining, but um, that, that would be, you need somebody with eminent domain to put it in there. If these are, when you think about the whole state of Maine and how many projects involving new capacity have been built in the last 20 years you know, on the fingers of one hand. I mean, and most of it was with federal money up around Prescott House and Caribou. Um, but, you know, uh, there, there hasn't been a lot built. 
And Peter, you characterize this as the single most congested area in the state. Is I, I think there's no question. I think this is. I think this if this place that cries out for for a through road that would, to relieve us. I mean, you made the case to us, both of you, very clearly that you don't know what. There is a temptation someday to extend utilities up into North Scarborough, and Gorham has the same problem, wanting to extend water and sewer south. Neither neither community knows what the future is of those villages, or the combined village, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And it's, you're, par you're not paralyzed exactly, but you, it, it's until you, until, as all of the residents keep saying, until you get rid of our traffic, we can't even think about what this place is supposed to look like. It's very compelling. I don't know if anyone does that commute. I don't think any of us. But the last time I was coming back from McDonald's at five o'clock, back towards mm. the, the beach, and I was shocked. Yeah, I went by at least a mile, a mile and a half yeah. of traffic, mm -hmm. yeah. backed up to the 22 lights on 114. Yeah. 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 I couldn't have it's practically went to Jim house. It's not only, but it's not only Gorham Road either. It overflows onto Running, uh, Hill. Running Hill and and everything else. I mean, those those two those two stop sign intersections, you could sit there for 40 minutes yeah. at rush hour waiting to, to, just to get on to 114 or come off on 114. Yeah. So it's it's I don't I think it's not just limited to that quarter. It's a, it is I think a regional problem. And it's not limited, I don't, I don't believe it's limited any longer to a.m. and p.m. Um, and, or weekday. Um, my daughter plays soccer out there on Saturday night, and it's, I mean, it's not backed up, but it's heavy, steady traffic on a Saturday night. Yeah. I'd rather be doing other things, but I'm out there <laughs> in a dome. <laughs> I did want to mention, so uh, for the council of so uh, Bill, myself, Chris, and Will went to the GP COG session out in Gorham. I believe there were four towns, maybe a fifth one. So Gorham, Scarborough, Wyndham, and Buxton were definitely representative. I'm not sure if Stanis was, was there. Was invited. I don't think it was yeah, representative. Yeah, I don't think and so um, the way that GP COG managed the session was that we broke up into individual work groups. There were four, maybe mm -hmm. three. The number one consensus issue that needs to be addressed regionally is transportation in this particular project across the board from all the other communities. So this isn't just an interest for us. It truly is. It, you know, everyone shared a concern. It was the number one on each each work groups. I think we're going to get so lateral good. support from Portland. Right. The yeah. PACS, PACS also had a similar meeting yeah. after that, and there was a lot of right. discussion around the need for this and, and the benefits of it regionally versus just... So the real thing for us is that it predominantly resides in our town. And so mm -hmm. the sorts of decisions made, uh, we need to be fully engaged in part sure. of this process and yeah. are prepared yeah. to do that if you wish. We're gonna so all things um, being positive, what, you know, you get legislative approval, what kind of time frame do you expect this process, to, you know, all, if all the stops are taken out and there's no hurdles and hiccups, I mean, you talk in five, you talk in three years, five years, from five to ten. I'd say ten. more five to ten. Five to ten. I mean, the permitting process alone is going to be significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the Transportation Act, which we've already, in large measure, complied with through this in the last six years that we've been working with. But that needs to be all of the data that fed into this report needs to be up, updated. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be very interesting to see how many of the projections from 2009 have been either met or exceeded. Uh, and then uh, we need a, you know, just a in fact, <coughs> you have to, as your process goes forward, you have to constantly update the data because it gets stale after two or three or four years. So, so, Mr. Mill, uh, can you explain the, so, you know, um, I'm, I'm in support of this. I've seen this around for a long time. Um, if this goes through and there's no hiccups and it gets approved, is there an um, interactive process or engagement process with the community as far as, uh, you know, whether you have uh, um, little, work, not work groups, pr presentations to the villages and the communities and the neighborhoods where you can get feedback from them regarding that process? Does that happen with the MTA? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're going through a process right now with um, a, the needs assessment for the main line through Portland. Mm -hmm. um, it's a PACS process where we have, you know, a public advisory committee. We're going to establish one to kind of, because we understand that it's sensitive. There is a balancing. I mean, some people like the capacity, other people don't want it. I mean, there are a lot of different needs yeah. Yeah. that we have to listen to and, you know, make judgments on and move forward. 
based upon. So I think that this process had an extensive public outreach um, part of component. We had um, a staff person, just Carol Morris, was dedicated to just that mm -hmm. public outreach. Okay. So I anticipate the same thing well, would happen. Peter, you've been in politics for a long time. <laughs> the one word that everyone, the one or two words that everyone's going to hear from this session is "them in a domain," mm -hmm. and so it's going to, it's going, you're going to get that sensitivity and that kind of emotional response to that. So I just want to make sure that the public, because a lot of people do watch it, know that there's going to be an open process to it. There will be an opportunity locally uh, through our comprehensive plan process over the next 12 to 18 months. We'll be establishing relationships and we'll know how to connect with these folks in particular. And so there's nothing to say that we can't initiate some additional outreach yep. to, to make sure it's fully exhausted. And I'm sure NTA would be willing participants as, as part of that. Oh, yeah. Are you anticipating putting something specific in your comprehensive plan about this? I don't know that. I just know that we're going to be undertaking that over the next 12 to 18 months. So we right. the benefit of having, gone, having those conversations. Maybe Transportation Committee picked up. Well, that and, and not too long ago, we had that process for the Gore Borough. <laughs> um, so we have that, that audience already. Mm -hmm. um, we have a list of who attended and mailing, mailing labels, all those things. So I think combination of that fairly recent public process coupled with a new larger town-wide process um, you know, I don't know that we'd try to mimic what you're doing. That wouldn't be productive, but we can augment. be augmented and yeah. think about the land use implications of if it does happen, what should we be doing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if there is a connector, where should there should there not be connection points? Again, coordinating right. with you, we don't want to <coughs> promise things that shouldn't aren't necessarily going to happen, but we can be to the extent that working you can, with you yeah. along the way. To the extent that you can create contingent changes to your comprehensive plan that would mm. take advantage of the fact that this corridor exists, it would be very powerful in helping us mm -hmm. make the case to the regula regulators and to the public. Say, look, there are towns that are depending on our ability to do this. Is, is this a presentation that we can make publicly available? Is this going to get them? Sure. It's available now. It's all things public. <laughs> well, yeah. but I mean, post it on the website and post it as well. Yeah. Get a copy of it. And then for the question. Um, do we have a, is there a more detailed uh, map of the quarter itself that's kind of been thought of, or is that kind of that oval of the most of it? There is um, some more detailed um, thoughts of where it's just difficult when you start putting something, as you know, on a map mm -hmm. for both the public side of things and the permitting side of things. Um, because unfortunately, the permitting side of things kind of makes you look at all kinds of different alignments. So I don't know that we've um, kind of developed a formal well, we haven't alignment even, We haven't really just, uh, one thing we need input from is where shall there be chain interchange? Mm -hmm. How do you get off this thing? Not, not, you know, not just at either mm -hmm. end necessarily. It could be, just yeah. straight through. But, but probably you ought to be able to get off at one or two other locations in the middle. So that, that kind of brings up the question of what kind of input or or process would we do if we would we need to uh, propose where we want those interchanges to be in Scarborough or decide we don't want an interchange in Scarborough or we want I mean what you know is there a, a range of we can have at one to two or you know, we want one every, every no. quarter mile where it's coming you know, you know what I mean no, we, 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 what we do is probably take our traffic consultants and say yeah. all right traffic is intense enough off at certain locations that it would jump Justify looking at an interchange at maybe two or three points. I, I don't. I doubt seriously this thing would have more than three yeah. intermediary. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that would also play an impact on where those interchange connection points are for the rest of the town. If we're depending on the if they're in town, where they're feeding off of and where they're coming off of. Exactly. And, and you, you can't have too many because the, the rules, the, the, the standards under the Federal Highway Administration are that I-295 does not comply. Should I say more? I mean, going through Portland, that is not that is a non-compliant interstate. Mm -hmm. There's a classic example. And they built it knowing it was non-compliant, but they had to get people in and out of downtown. Mm -hmm. And we do not want to replicate that. And, and there are between 42, the, 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 uh, the, the outdoor store there, <laughs> and... and uh, and for in 53, we have eight interchanges on the main turnpike, and they are all 
more than a mile apart. And, and, and my life, as long as I'm in here, there will be no more interchanges from 44 to 53. There should not be. That's mm -hmm. plenty. Mm -hmm. But, so you need them about a mile apart. And we've got a five mile stretch. The corridor is about five miles long. You're not probably, if you wanted as a through corridor, you're probably not going to see more than two or three intermediary off, off ramps. So the other question I have is that, you know, it sounds like you tell Portland, Gorham, and us, uh, do you have a feel for if, if Westbrook is also uh, uh, going to comply? If they don't, what does that do to the process? Or are they going to sign on to this? And should they decide not to? Does that they've change the been, process at all? They've been, yeah, they've okay. been fully engaged. Um, we met yeah. with staff just before elections. Um, we had a, and they seemed to, they didn't anticipate that either way their elections went that it would be an issue. Um, I mean, they're really only to benefit from it, of the improvements, so I don't see them being... It's partially designed, it's one of its pur purposes is to help Westbrook mm -hmm. relieve, mm -hmm. to some extent. 25 is relieved a little bit. It's not a major, it's not the major thing. Excellent. Any other questions? <laughs> I want to thank you both very much for coming thank and you really do appreciate us. it. And unless there is uh, any objection from the council, I'd ask that the manager maybe uh, schedule this for the next meeting so that we can have a full conversation around that at the council level. Um, that way we can um, fully vet that. <coughs> thank you very much if, for coming. It was wonderful. Is that time frame fast enough for us to get this up to the legislature before they act on it? Your next talk soon is March 1st, so I presume yeah. the hearing won't occur until some point. It'll be after March 1st. Okay, that's yeah. fine. I just want to make sure we're There's not the time after that. Right. Great. Thank you very much. You mean how often? Every two weeks? Thank you very much. First and third way.
a workshop um, on uh, the Gorham East West uh, Corridor uh, question with the main Park Authority. So it's about 7 3, 7 04 p.m. This is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council for Wednesday, February 15th. Um, and uh, I'd like to call the uh, call to order. If you could all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Here. 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 And just for the record, uh, Councillor St. Clair and Councillor Foley are um, we're not able to make it this evening for business purposes, and they will join us at our next meeting. And uh, moving on to item number four, general public comments. If you'd like to uh, speak um, on any item that is not on the agenda, you have three minutes, and if you'd like to take the podium, you can be recognized to speak. Is there anybody that would like to speak? One once? It's like the rotary. You have to go three times. Have got twice? Excellent. We'll move on. That closes the public comments. Item number five is the minutes for February 1st, 2017. Is there a motion from the council? Move approval. Second. Any modifications, edits, corrections that need to be noted for the clerk? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Adjustments to the agenda. I have none at the moment. Um, items to be signed. I'll sign the treasurer's warrants as we go through the meeting. And moving on to order number 17-013 at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Public hearing and action on the new request for a combined massage establishment massage therapist license from Jamil Jamil Rich, DBA Rich Massage and Skin Care, located at 51 U.S. Route 1, Suite R-2. And um, I would like to open up uh, for, for public comment. Anybody would like to speak on the massage license? Not seeing any. We'll close the public hearing and um, have a motion. Uh, so moved. Second. And um, just for the public, um, any issues? I, I, I'm assuming that since it's on the on the, item, uh, on the agenda that they've met all the requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Any comments or questions? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. There is no old business at this time. We're moving on to new business. Order number 17-014. A first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough's Traffic Ordinance, <coughs> Section 25, Parking Restrictions, Subsection A. Dot, um, IV hyphen 1, Pine Point. Um, with that, I'd like to open up for public comments. Anybody that would like to speak from the, from the public? Not seeing any, we'll close public comment and move on to, before we have a motion, um, I'd like to ask the manager for an overview. Certainly, this matter has been before the Ordinance Committee and with staff for more than two years, as I recall. Uh, we've done extensive outreach with the business community. Uh, there's been a number of residents of the Pike One area that have been involved um, throughout the, the course of the time. Uh, but more recently, we've had uh, found a partnership with DOT, who's interested in doing some resurfacing work on this lower section of the road, and we're successful in having them delay that work um, from last year to this spring to allow us to really put in, into practice our complete streets policy and come up with a new um, redesign of that section of roadway. And thankfully, uh, Angela Blanchett came on our, our staff at the right time and was able to provide some design assistance uh, to staff and then uh, most recently to the Ordinance Committee and the committee's recommending what seemingly, and it really is a very simple amendment to the traffic ordinance, but there's a fair amount to it, and with your indulgence, uh, Angela's here tonight, and I, I think it'd be worth your while just to have her make a presentation to what the new uh, section would look like. Absolutely. Thank you. Looks like you just lost power. Nope. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Um, yes, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Angela Blanchett, um, town engineer, and I am uh, fortunate to be also on the transportation committee and liaison for that, so um, very active group, and we um, have a member here with us tonight, too, that will probably speak um, later on, because we did go quite, through quite a process, and as Tom said, this is a pretty simple, I've been in front of the ordinance committee in the past with the simple parking changes. Um, this obviously has 
some background, and so if you'll indulge me, I'm, I'm just going to go through a little bit of background and history with that. Um, so to start off, I just wanted to, to give you an overview of what specifically we're talking about. Um, the, the ordinance um, change in front of you is specifically for snow canning, which is pretty much in the center of, of this slide um, on the bottom, to the East Grand Ave intersection. And um, the reason this first came up in front of Transportation Committee is when we have projects come through the town, staff is asked to look at opportunities that we can piggyback on um, some DOT or federal um, projects. And with that, it's an opportunity, as Tom said, to incorporate not only our complete streets policy that we now have in place, but also um, to look at any outstanding issues with different corridors that, you know, that affect us locally that we can incorporate and find an economical way to resolve. And so what the Transportation Committee um, and members and other residents are hearing is there is on-street parking occurring along this section of Pine Point Road and happened under default rather than vision, I would say, from the town. It started parking along there and not really designed for that. So what I was asked to look at was showing some design alternatives that would incorporate safe on street parking and also accommodating other uses along that corridor. So the DOT project that came in in front of us is a strictly paving preservation project and that would be from the railroad bridge which is all the way on the right hand side of the slide down to the East Grand Ave intersection. Left hand side. Oh, left hand side. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and so with that, uh, it went in front of the Transportation Committee. We looked at some alternatives in design and looking at the cross section. Um, once that they looked at obviously the struggles that are happening, whether <coughs> we look at some alternatives with on-street parking, with no on-street parking. Peter Hayes was um, at the table with us as well as the council liaison, which was helpful to hear, um, to look at different alternatives. And once we came up with what I consider a compromise was we looked at um, taking it to get public feedback. I wanted to point out though, I know you're all familiar with this section of road. This is the existing conditions down there at Pine Point. This is as you're coming off the railroad bridge. It is an incline. Um, and as you descend down from the railroad bridge, it's pretty wide open and a highway field feel to that. So one of the, the tasks the Transportation Committee obviously is looking for is with complete streets. We look at how are pedestrian and bicycles accommodated, uh, traffic calming measures, look like that was necessary. And then also just the feel of the, the neighborhood as you're coming in, like as I said, from a highway feel off that bridge, you're entering into a beach community. And so this was also an opportunity to see, use um, a smaller amount of funds to make some vast improvements. So as a contrast, you can see um, this is a, just a rendering of the proposed project, which shows uh, bump outs where tree, street trees planted, uh, a designated crosswalk, designated bike lanes, a specific spaces allocated for on-street parking, and uh, reconstruction of the sidewalk. So once the Transportation Committee had found one they were relatively comfortable with presenting. We went and had a public meeting down at the, um, the Pine Point Fire Station that was held in March of last year. And it was pretty well attended, I would say, for a public meeting. We had um, Transportation Committee, I think um, a couple of counselors were there in attendance, which was great, um, and heard obviously pros and cons for parking obviously came up and really it came down to what we were hearing from staff and the committee members was that the issue with the on-street parking out there was safety concerns with bicycles and, um, and also that it really wasn't designed 
for on street parking not that on street parking wanted you know to eliminate completely it was how do you do it safely i think was really the key and so with that feedback um, transportation committee made some modifications and um, just minor at that and we came back with a revised plan which was um, fully endorsed by the Transportation Committee. And what you'll see is um, narrower travel lanes. We're going down to 11-foot travel lanes. I know it's hard to see, and I apologize. I think it's in your packet, too, though. And um, two bike lanes, one on either side, a four- and five-foot bike lane, designated uh, nine-foot parking stalls, and the reconstruction of the five-foot sidewalk. All of the parking is shown here on, I would say, the southerly side, which is the side where the landing is located. And I know some questions came up in the ordinance committee about how that came about, which side of the street as opposed to the other. And really it comes down to finance. Uh, when we have an existing sidewalk in place, we have a certain amount of gravels and, and existing infrastructure there. So for us to resurface that, that sidewalk is a lot more um, feasible for, from an economical point of view than to build a new sidewalk on the other side of the street. And then obviously you want to have the parking with the sidewalk, not only for those parking to be able to access the sidewalk easily, but it also gives a buffer for those pedestrians on the sidewalk from the traveling public, the motorists. There was also a question that came up in the ordinance committee about um, the crossings. And you can see from this one, the existing intersection that's down there at Pine Point. Um, it's obviously not <coughs> a traditional three-way intersection that you would see in town. Again, it's more of a highway feel. And as you can see, in order to cross through that intersection is three, cro three crossings for a pedestrian, which really speaks more to how do we address the intersection. And so this brings us back to the master planning that we're starting at the Pine Point area. The intersection is going to be a key piece of that and getting a lot of feedback from residents and those that travel through that often. We obviously want to make it a safe intersection and also predictable where this, um, people are a little confused by this, I will say. And so with that, we can incorporate any of the pedestrian crossings through that and, and, a, and make sure that's a key element in that. So our project now stops just short of that intersection. And um, in the master planning process, um, we have looked at some alternative designs these are just some um, basic schematics that we put together for the public meeting that actually we already held last November. We started that public process down at um, Pine Point. And so all of those measures, when we're looking at future improvements through there, the, the improvements that we're proposing along Pine Point Road would not interfere, I think, with future planning of that area. Um, so I know this isn't a basic amendment to the traffic um, ordinance, but I'm hoping to keep that, I, I guess, as simple as we can to move this project forward. DOT has uh, pushed this project off. It was due to be happened last year, but with the railroad bridge completion, they wanted to make sure they incorporated that um, after the fact and they can do the surface paving down through, which factored in nicely, for, I think, for us to be able to put some thought into it and actually get uh, feedback from the public and put in something that I think will do us um, some good for, for quite some time. Um, Bea Bacon is also here, and I think Karen Martin wanted to speak, and um, a member of the Transportation Committee, so I'm just going to leave it to them. Do you have questions for me? Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, some of the feedback we've heard uh, over the years. I can't forget that. Yeah. So is, is the um, uh, what happened kind of I don't know if I would call that west or north of the Snow Cannery Road to the bridge? Uh huh. Because uh, right now when I drive down there in the summer, there's cars parked on both sides. 
<laughs> and my understanding is this proposal doesn't address that at all, so we we'll continue to allow <coughs> um, on that part of the road. It doesn't eliminate, right. What we're proposing does not eliminate the parking from Snow Canyon up to the railroad bridge. I'm wondering, did, did the committee look at that? Did you, did you consider that at all? Um, no, at this point we were limiting <coughs> what we, um, for traffic coming measures below Snow Canning. It's not something that we could, um, I mean, we could definitely look at into it for the future. And as we see how this progresses, I would say, does that mean parking gets shifted further up? Or maybe it doesn't because it's so far from the beach. It's something that doesn't prohibit us to come back and, and modify that. That's probably a simpler um, process come in. That would probably be a simple traffic ordinance change, I would say. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and I'm not sure, Andrew, if this is the right question for you, maybe it's for more for the town manager or, or the chiefs out there as well. Has uh, this been an, uh, what's the enforcement issues currently now? Is there no parking signs there and people are just parking? Is there no signage there at all? Uh, and it's just kind of a free-for-all? Um, I can answer that and certainly to chime in. Uh, historically, there has not been any parking restrictions. Now, until recently, the last three or four years, anecdotally, there were, there had, for reasons we're not quite sure of, people haven't chosen to park. I have some theories as to what's happened in this area that may have caused <coughs> uh, an active on-street parking area. I personally think it has a lot to do with our improvements to Silvery Park. <coughs> and that access to the beach. Um, there's also some businesses that have cropped up in this, this area that undoubtedly contribute to that. So historically, there's never been a park restriction. It's just, practically speaking, just happened over the last two or three seasons. Um, yeah. and, and I should say public works, uh, upon the authority they already have, have installed signs in terms of no parking here at a corner, just those kind of safety things that don't need to be done by ordinance. Uh, but short of that, um, there's no other restrictions. So would this proposal um, basically make this the only legal parking area on this road? Or if you could still go, as we set up the snow cannery, and park there without any enforcement or any, any concerns of tickets? Or this amendment limits the parking restrictions from snow canning down to East Grant. Well, let, me answer, um, let me answer that. You have to in most places in Scarborough, it has to be restricted parking or otherwise on-street parking other than overnight is allowed. <coughs> and so there is presently no restriction on either side of Pine Point Road from East Grand Avenue to the bridge. Uh, so people have developed a habit in recent years of parking on both sides of the road. And I think that's in part because businesses have grown, businesses have started up that do not have adequate parking. I, I parked on the street out there going to an event at the land. I think that's what, what happened. Uh, this would not restrict any aspect of the parking uh, from Snow Canyon Road to the bridge. All it does is restricts parking on the north side of Pine Point Road <coughs> in front of the Clam, clam pick, pick facility primarily. So, um, what kind of signage would we be looking at as well? Would it still be, you know, we would post that no parking? Um, and, and I guess my question is, is you know, looking at this, is there, did transportation look at banning parking altogether on that stretch from a safety perspective? If, if the concern is safety and it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of shoulder there, um, you know, instead of doing a, a, a widening, infrastructure widening or something, have we looked at another alternative of just not allowing parking there at all because there's not enough space or room to, safe, to, to safely park there? Um, right, because of the shift and we're adding the bike lanes where we are <coughs> from snow canning down, mm -hmm. it really leaves you, like I said, four to five feet of bike lane, mm -hmm. which I would think most people going through there would say, I can't park in a four foot bike lane. Um, and so I think it really speaks to that, it, I guess common sense, I'm going to leave it at that, <laughs> is as do you have room to park? And now we're accommodating it on one side to say, this is where you're supposed to park. So as far as alternatives go, 
I guess we were just looking at for this project and strictly looking at it as DOT is spending this much money in the town, what can we do to provide safe parking in a limited amount of funds? And, and this is where we ended up with, as I would say, is a compromise. And that's pretty much how we've kind of spoken about it from the Transportation Committee and even in the public hearing is, is, is coming up with this middle ground. And it doesn't preclude anything from happening further um, in the future projects. My recollection, the complaints from the public, um, this, this section of roadway is actually uh, quite wide and generous. There's paved shoulders, unlike we really don't have this anywhere in town, uh, but for here. The complaint I heard wasn't that the cars were not able to park safely, that uh, there was no accommodation for bikes and pedestrians and someone opening their door intermittently. And that's what this design intends to do, is to really create spaces for the different uses. And, and would that be some an enforcement concern if we've got people parking into the bike lanes? Is that something we would have signage saying, you know, no parking, this parking here only? How would we enforce that? Would we enforce that normally like we all you know, would do parking anywhere? Or is I there going to be... I, I, I thought about it. This, the signs would likely say parking in designated spaces only. Um, there is some element of common sense. If you have a line space, I, we expect people to understand what that means. Yeah, I, I mean, I would expect there would be no parking signs heading west, sure. uh, which has sure. only got a bike lane. It yeah. doesn't have a sidewalk. Yeah. Heading east, you have a sidewalk and a bike lane uh, 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 and parking. Uh, but that's only from <coughs> Spokane to uh, East Grand. Right. Uh, it's the rather wide shoulders that are beyond that. No, because it wasn't within the scope of the review that the transportation and the department, uh, our department, took. That is pretty much left alone. That's just a repayment. The question becomes, do we address that now, or do we observe what happens there, gain some knowledge, and then take action? Because presently, we need to act on this now, because the project from uh, a state point of view, it's going to happen this spring. Sure. My, my only concern, sorry, my only concern is that, you know, when we create something like this, it's an, it, it, how do we enforce this? You know, if we just kind of leave it as common sense, unfortunately, this is so common. Um, and, and if we're just going to designate parking areas and in the hopes that people are going to generally park there, I don't know if, if, if there's also a secondary component of that of how do we restrict parking on the other side and prevent people from, I mean, if they have a big sign that says no parking, you know, or what? You know, uh, or we generate, you know, a, 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 a violation or a ticket like we normally do, or, you know, is there, is it just going to be, we're hoping to guide people there? No, there, there are existing provisions. We okay. have partners with elsewhere in town, so we're not creating something new. No, 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 I'm not just so, so, yeah. so if you don't mind, yeah. um, so uh, we're still in the uh, question and answer phase for staff, and we're getting, and getting into a little bit beyond that. So uh, they're great conversation pieces that I think the council needs to have. I just want to use staff appropriately, and I know that there's a couple others that would love to get up from staff that would get up to speak, but do you have a question, Peter? Yeah, just a, just a quick question. Um, just a real quick question, as we think about beach access is always a big issue, so there is parking now, people do park, and it's a busy summer season, they are parking on both sides of the road. Do you have an estimate of how many parking spots are being eliminated by what you're proposing along this section? And the second question I have for you, after attending that meeting, the next conversation was they wanted to eliminate parking also along East Grand, which is, I know, another phase of the project. But part of what I'm thinking about, though, I mean, there were a lot of people I heard, and the question was, why are so many people parking there? But I heard a lot of people say that don't live down there. I know the Pine Point residents where they are, but a lot of people are saying, by the time they get to the beach, the, the municipal parking lot's full. There's no place to go. Beach access is really tough. So really just like trying to get a perspective of how many parking spots are you potentially eliminating? And is there also conversations about eliminating parking spots along East Grand? Well, I guess my first comment is going to be, um, when you talk about how many spaces you're eliminating, I would say no safe designated parking you're eliminating. I think what's happened is people are parking in inadequate shoulders. And so as far as how many are parking there during the summer months, 
I, I couldn't say because it's not really defined and probably the residents down there probably have a better ballpark than I would because um, like you said I think in certain days of the summer um, those all align and I think community services when we asked them had said it was really that lot only fills up maybe two or three times there's certain there's certain things that align where the park where the parking lot the town parking lot fills up um, and but it's not a norm so um, I guess I, I don't have an answer for how many exact spaces there are 18 spaces that are proposed that are proposed the mirror side the other side of the street it, it is not going to allow for spaces so the answer probably is in the 18 range although all the way up to the bridge is a very very substantial number beyond Snow Canyon Road so in some senses you're not limiting the total number at all because that using the road all the way up to the bridge there's never been parking all the way up you are moving some width further away from the beach and let's say on that upper side on that map there that view there's more curb cuts on that upper side so there are less arguably less parking opportunities anyway just by virtue of the number of curb cuts that exist that's true <coughs> is, the sh is the shoulder wider up towards the county side it greatly varies it is wider, yes. Thank you. Comments? Yeah. Uh, Angela mentioned that we are doing a master plan for this area coming up. We had a meeting in November, and there'll be more master planning done that, that looks at East Grand Avenue and where there should be parking, where there shouldn't be parking. And I think as Angela uh, mentioned earlier, even on this stretch of road, on the clam bank side, if during those master planning meetings there's a lot of interest in on-street parking on that side of the street, um, this project doesn't preclude in the future adding some on-street parking, adding a sidewalk. I think what's kind of key is that this is a project with a small window of time where we can economically make these improvements and can always come back to, and if the council wants to, through master planning, perhaps add parking on the clan big side, and most importantly, if you're adding parking, add a sidewalk. You know, that's really a key factor in this, is part of the safety issue out there is people are parking in these parking spaces slash shoulders, and only on one side are they then able to move to the beach, move around on the sidewalk, versus walking in the grass, walking in the road. So I think that's I think parking is key out there, and we're going to keep talking about it over the next, you know, six, eight, ten months. And if if it's compelling and the council wants us to, you know, we can always piggyback on this project. I guess is my point. Um, this isn't preventing future investment. It's sort of being opportunistic. And when you say add parking on the clam bake side of the road, you have to widen the road there. Right. So There's an the adequate right of way. The problem is, you know, the clan bakes parking is in some of the right-of-way, frankly. You know, they have a curb there. There's grass in front of um, the Ready Seafood site. So there's adequate main DOT property ownership. Right now it's being used for other things. You know, so that's a bigger conversation. It's just a question, Ben. Is it fair to say that we're not removing any width of pavement? We're just reallocating its use? Right. I mean, the, this is really, curve to curve. like you said, reallocating the use of the current width of what's so, pavement. So to this point, uh, we're putting down lines of paint to delineate bike lanes that can certainly be removed at very low cost if that's the direction we want to go. So, can, can I ask a question? Um, I, I thought I saw in the diagram that we're actually going to have a, a kind of a bump out there by the end of Cannery Road that would kind of with a curve? Yeah, on the on-street parking side, there is bookends, if you want to call them bump outs, um, that protect the on-street parking, which is fairly common, you know, having um, you know, bump outs or islands on the other end of the on-street parking. Right. We'll get over that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Karen Martin with Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. Um, we did just want to be here to support the work that the Transportation Committee has done on complete streets. 
Um, my board has reviewed the Complete Street Program with Dan Bacon last year. I feel very strongly that it adds um, to the community and it can be very good for um, economic development and uh, the businesses. Um, in this area. We're, I think, particularly excited about the treatment of this area that it's been looked at both with meetings, um, public meetings and meetings with businesses, and they really thoughtfully applied the Complete Street program to this section of Pine Point. Um, we also feel like this is a, a reasonable compromise that um, really addresses streetscape, safety, um, bicycle and pedestrian safety, you know, and it, it may not be the perfect solution for every business, but it's a good compromise. Um, so again, we wanted to uh, support this program that's going on here, and we do believe that adding safety to for pedestrians and for bicyclists can actually help um, increase the business, increase the customers for this area. Thank you very much. With that, um, is there a motion from the council? So moved. Second. Second. And um, I just want to, uh, for the record, just because it's only one sentence, so I just wanted people to know what the actual change was. So in the change to Chapter 601, we're adding item number 3 to uh, Section 4-1, and it reads, No parking shall be allowed on Pine Point Road from East Grand, a East, East Grand Avenue to Snow Canning Road, except for within the delineated on street parking spaces on the southwesterly side of the road. So that is the changes happening. Um, council comments? Councilor Dunnevin. Uh, we had an ordinance committee meeting uh, recently, the last one, and uh, this was the topic of discussion. Uh, we had a couple of speakers, uh, uh, one uh, uh, proposing that no parking be allowed whatsoever on Pine Point Road from East Grand Avenue to the bridge. <coughs> uh, the other was on the opposite side with the plan bank uh, attorney advocating that nothing uh, be done to interfere with the on-street parking that presently existed. The reference to a compromise is, I think, to those two uh, contrary positions. Uh, we looked at it, and I think Karen Martin very fairly summarized the advantages that were seen in this compromise uh, and that's really how it gathered support. Um, the uh, plan bank has about 160 spaces uh, and I think people sometimes take advantage of that and park there. That's an issue for that uh, operator. Uh, uh, but based on the four to one ratio for seats in a restaurant and one parking space, uh, they can accommodate about 700 seats in their restaurant. And they, they recite that they have 700 seats in the restaurant. So it would take quite a crowd to fill that up. Uh, they have quite a bit of parking capacity. The right of way is also extends into their parking that edges up towards the street. So uh, uh, parking on uh, uh, improvements on that side are better left alone so as not to interfere with that business, which we thought was an appropriate accommodation. So that's part of the decision why it was made on uh, the southern side of the road. So the, it was a unanimous vote to support this coming out of ordinance. Thought it was thoughtful and been heard by transportation. Uh, the staff had a lot of public hearings on it. Uh, uh, it seemed to be uh, well vetted. Councilor Rowland? Yeah, so uh, I did get to. Um, uh, see this when it was presented at, at the Pine Point Fire Station, and I, I think it's a, uh, a really nice, nicely done um, design. Um, I really think it's going to improve the area. <coughs> I, I am concerned that we're still going to have a safety issue um, northwest of Snow Cannery Road, but I think we'll we can address that at another time. Thank you, Council Chiazzo. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's a good compromise. My concern is always is twofold: <coughs> safety, number one. If there's still a safety concern there, I, I know we try to mitigate that as best we could. Second thing for me is always enforcement. Once we start putting parking ordinances in anywhere in town, there's got to be a way to to have positive enforcement. Otherwise, they need nothing. So uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we don't enforce them right now. I just want to make sure that when we make the changes, there's a mechanism in place that we have a method to enforce them, and, and it's communicated properly, signage is correct so that there aren't any questions or concerns, and safety is first and foremost. 
I think also if you look at the design, I don't think I don't think you're going to see parking on the north side of that road just because it, you're going to be in that travel lane. It's a really small shoulder, but certainly a possibility. Yeah, I really applaud. I mean, it's great work. I think it really visually enhances down there. As a bicyclist, I I bike down there quite frequently, so I would really appreciate sort of the lane. Um, I, I certainly will support in the first read. The only piece that I have, and whether we get any comment or not, is the other side of the coin, which are those people that are saying they you know access to beaches is becoming a problem. Even if the municipal lot's not full, ten dollars is still for some people. So anyway, if we hear, uh, I'm just curious whether we'll hear anything in public comment. But I, I support this, and I, I think it's a great enhancement to that area and efficient use of the funds. Um, just uh, I was actually asking the town clerk to look this up. I did want to mention that we did receive one letter from a citizen in support of the changes that are being recommended, and I called him <coughs> about that person's name, but it was nice to have. Uh, and her name is Sue and Vincent Bailey. Sue and Vincent Bailey. And uh, Sue and Vincent Clow and William Bailey. So I just want to say thank you and recognize them that we did receive that letter and it was shared to the council. Um, a couple of pieces. One is um, I like how this is really, I, I look at this as a phasing process and this is really just the first phase because I share um, the same comments or the same kind of focus on the risk on the northwest side. Personally, I would rather see that entire area from basically the bridge to East Grand Avenue have delineated parking or designated parking um, and not simply have it open from Snow Canyon to the bridge. I think it would be um, just simply a, a much safer place. Um, also wanted to mention that I think that this is nice because it's finally Pine Point is getting the attention that it needs regarding we've concentrated for so many years on other areas, you know, Pleasant Hill, Oak Hill, Running Hill Road. Um, so to, to provide this, I think that this is a, a very nice um, phase in process. So I appreciate the work that's been put into this and the Transportation Committee in particular uh, for looking at this. So I'm definitely in support of it. Um, any other comments from Council? Questions? Um, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is order number 17-015, first reading and schedule a public hearing, and second reading on a six-month moratorium on retail marijuana establishments and retail marijuana social clubs. Uh, with that, I would like to um, actually ask for an overview from the uh, Ordinance Committee Chairman. Or would you prefer to the manager, Bill? Uh, uh, I'm sure Tom will uh, contribute. Uh, uh, what we had was uh, uh, a draft uh, uh, ordinance prepared by uh, our town council, uh, town manager, uh, collaborating on that. Uh, it calls for a six-month moratorium as provided by state law. Uh, it can be extended once. Uh, we'll uh, introduce an amendment in a moment. Uh, to insert the public hearing date proposed because that's required by law, as we've learned. Uh, and uh, in meeting with the Metro Coalition, seven towns uh, all around Portland, they're all <coughs> introducing moratoriums uh, in similar fashion and taking a go-slow approach because the state will not conclude its permitting rules until February of 2018. Thank you. And actually, um, unless you have something, you no. know, what I would like to, I always forget this, I do want to actually open this up to public comment. If there's anybody that would like to speak on the item, you can uh, come up to the podium and speak. You have three minutes. If you can state your name and address, it would be greatly appreciated for the clerk. <coughs> Uh, Benjamin Howard, Seven Winds of um, I'd just like to start by uh, saying I, I, I don't really understand the need for a moratorium on this issue. Um, from reading through the documentation that was provided, uh, I've heard a little bit a, a bit differently that the state's not uh, going to answer permitting um, until February of 2018. But uh, I didn't see that in the document. But uh, first off, I'd, I'd just like to say I, I, I'm opposed to the idea as I, I don't understand why we need more time to discuss this. The time is, is now to, to act upon it. Now, I understand if, if the idea is maybe it's 
for uh, safety hazards or we're concerned about uh, youth. But I, I'd like to just bring up a couple statistics from Colorado and from Maine in our, our own uh, child development programs here. Um, first off, since full legalization in Colorado, um, in 2009, 25% of high school kids had used marijuana um, in, the last two, in the last 30 days. In 2015, that was down in Colorado to 21%. Uh, comparing the average marijuana usage in Colorado and to the national average in Colorado, it's 21.2% by the youth and 21.7% nationally. Finally, I'd like to just bring up our own state here where marijuana usage is uh, above the um, national average at 38% from what data I could find. But more interestingly, it was 59% for alcohol. Now, if this is the safety concern for the public, why then do we continue in the about a mile radius of this high school, continue to approve uh, liquor licenses, uh, O'Brien's, El Rayo, all these are within eye distance of the high school. In fact, every day you turn out, you see O'Brien. You can see the bar through there. So if that is a concern, um, I, I don't really see the point. If kids are really the priority, why do we keep allowing this? To continue on that sort of, um, uh, to continue on that path there, um, you know, if it's drunk driving sort of deal, Hound Labs is releasing their breathalyzer which can test for both alcohol and marijuana in the breath um, actually this year and we probably can buy a product and get it tested for free by them uh, at this very time. But I'd like to also to continue on because Maine Business did a very good piece on the wellness connection. Uh, Patricia Rosa, who owns the company, uh, last year the company netted $15 million. And she's predicting that the <coughs> marijuana industry will bring in $200 million in sales by comparison, Maine's lobster sales are $400 million per year. Um, she also goes on to comment that every dollar spent um, on marijuana adds $3 to the e economy of Maine. So I'd like to just propose that maybe we don't put a six-month moratorium on it. We put a shorter time period on it and really start to act on it because the time is now if we're going to have an opportunity to jump into this, you know, uh, Wild West. Now, what I'd like to say as, as comments are closing here is that you need to get the Cheech and Chong idea of a stoner out of your uh, out of your head. This is this is a medical drug. Her company requires you to wear two different suits to enter both rooms, and this is not required by the FDA right now. These are people that are interested in studying and learning the medical effects and the chemicals that can be created by growing this plant by putting in different inputs. So maybe instead of just saying no at all, we write legislation where people have to come up and present their ideas and we can really get an idea of what they're trying to do. What stoner really wants to buy a $10,000 gas chromatographer just so he can test his butt and say, wow, I got 49% THC. That's wicked cool. Someone that's willing to do that is more than willing to test other drugs. So I'd like to end by just using the statement, um, a famous quote by Ben Franklin, why put off what we can do today. Um, so, thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak? Without seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Um, and what is the pleasure of the council? So moved. Second. So I put it. Okay. Uh, second. Yeah. No, I think I got a second over here. Sorry. Um, comments, yes. Um, I'll make a motion to amend. Okay. The, uh, motion that's on the table. Uh, move approval of the first reading on a six-month moratorium on retail marijuana establishments and retail marijuana social clubs and schedule a public hearing for September 6, 2017. Is there a second? Second. Um, comments on the amendment? The, the law requires us to have a date for the public hearing and that's why we're inserting a date at this point. I just have a question about that. Is that something to be changed? Um, if we needed to or, or wanted to to be a different date, or is that being set tonight and that's the final? I think you probably could without a good notice. Yes. Any other questions or comments regarding the date? Um, I'm going to wait. Yeah, so um, 
Not seeing any, all in favor of the amendment to the motion. And that is unanimous. Uh, to the, uh, back to the uh, main motion, any comments or questions on the main mo motion? Mr. Donovan. Uh, we had it in front of the uh, uh, ordinance committee. No, uh, uh, no objections posed at the ordinance committee. It, uh, my attitude about this from the beginning has been you're better to be uh, slow and watch and observe how uh, processes, uh, ordinances, regulations unfold, what works, what doesn't, uh, so as to protect the best interests of the community. Thank okay. you. Mr. Chiazza. So um, I fully support the moratorium. I think there's just too many intangibles that are out there right now. Um, uh, there's concerns about labeling. There's concern about product control. There's concerns about the impact of potency versus impairment and the lack of studies that show that. Uh, there's a lack of existing state regulations. I think it would be incredibly imprudent for us to act without uh, a firmly established guidelines coming down from the state. Uh, we can't direct how they, how they perform or how they move this process forward, but I, I think for us to try and get out ahead of that curve is quite frankly irresponsible because if we put something in place now uh, and the state changes it or doesn't give uh, gives different uh, addresses, we could potentially grandfather something in uh, that is counterproductive or is counter to what the state regulatory agencies require. So I think prudence demands that we uh, we go slow, we wait for direction from the state, uh, and I think this is, uh, you know, there's nothing to say that it's, it's the law of the land, but if you've waited a lifetime for this, uh, waiting another six months to a year for the state to do it and do it correctly, I think is reasonable. Other comments? Yes. Hey, this is just, 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 just for clarification. So did I hear that we're really going to take the next six months and continue to kind of look at this and research it and make sure we develop a really solid sort of ordinance on where we want to be? I mean, is that, is that why we're asking for six months if there's a work in progress here that we're going to do some due diligence and fat gathering and that type of thing during this, this time period? Uh, that, that remains to be discussed. The, the extent to which uh, effort is put in in the immediate future yep. uh, because I think what we can benefit from is some communities like Portland are going ahead right now. All the other communities in the Metro Coalition yesterday's meeting said they're going slow. Uh, so we will learn from those communities that proceed. Uh, as to how they are regulating the agricultural uh, and growing side, the distribution side, uh, the chain of command through watching the product uh, uh, pass to the retail side, and the whole series of issues that Chris uh, just identified. So yes, we'll be watching that MMA is running a, uh, a symposium on it that I plan to attend in another month or two, uh, and so there will be an educational component, which I think probably the, the entire uh, ordinance committee will engage in. But I don't think we're going to get out ahead of ourselves by actively putting it on the agenda for hearings uh, uh, in, the, in the months ahead. We actually have quite a few things uh, otherwise to engage our attention. Mr. Rowan. I just want to uh, comment that I agree with uh, Councilor Piazzo in that it would be um, they would be imprudent to get out of, ahead of the state. We need to have some clarity in the state before we can pass the local ordinance. Any other? Um, just to add, um, so I think it's important to also reflect that while this may have passed at the state level, it did not pass at our local level. In fact, the vote was. Uh, 6,673 that voted no on the issue uh, versus 6,061, so it's about a 55-45 split. So us taking a prudent approach to this particular topic I think is consistent with what our voters and our community has asked us to do re with regard to that. I agree um, that you know we, we don't want to get out ahead of what the state legislature might set forth for us, but at the same time we need to communicate because there is a lot of interest being expressed um, and want, you know, um, these type of retail um, spaces do want to come here, in which at least I've been told by staff that many have already approached our planning department and our town um, with a lot of cash and, a lot, and ready to come to town. And I think that we need to communicate that we want to take a very thoughtful approach to this. And, um, so I do, I actually will support this, uh, 
coming out. So I appreciate the work that the ordinance committee did. Is there any other comments from council? Not seeing any. Um, all of, all in favor? Five to zero. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is order number 17-016, act on the request from the police department to authorize submission of a community development block grant in the amount of $33,000 for Operation Hope. Um, I'd like to open that up to public comment if anybody would like to speak on that item. Not seeing any, I'm going to close the public comment section and uh, <coughs> what is the, um, actually if the manager can give us an overview. Just a very quick overview, uh, we do have Chief Moulton and Captain Grover here that can go into more detail if you wish, but I think you're all familiar generally with Operation Hope uh, and our ongoing efforts to keep it alive, uh, thankfully without the use of tax dollars and that's I think a really important part of the project. Uh, it's not essential but I think it's really a point of pride to us frankly. Uh, but it's getting increasingly difficult and we've had enough uh, experience with the program to appreciate the sort of clients, their financial challenges, and we were thankfully encouraged from the county to apply for this grant and this is really kind of a stopgap, uh, but it, it enables us to have some additional money uh, for treatment and transportation to continue doing the good work <coughs> we have been doing since uh, uh, over a year now. Any um, a motion from the floor, from the council? So moved. Second. Questions for the manager or comments from council? Mr. Donovan. Uh, the, the, at this Metro Coalition meeting yesterday, <coughs> there were, we had a full-blown presentation uh, on uh, what was going on with the opiate addiction crisis uh, and what, how that group of seven towns can actually support the efforts that we're going forward. One of the things that was proudest for me in that meeting was just how uh, praised uh, Scarborough's police department was for Project Hope. Uh, and it was recognized that you can only go on so long uh, begging for spaces out of state because we don't have spaces in state. And so, I mean, I think the Metro Coalition came away with the conclusion we need to uh, support educational elements to uh, avoid people falling into this uh, situation and we need to be able to find ways to have detox and uh, therapeutic treatment to be able to, uh, by professionals, to be able to get people back uh, using the various drug treatments that apparently have been quite successful. Yeah. So um, I, I, I certainly applaud uh, the Scarborough Police Department for stepping forward. This needed Somebody needed to step forward. Uh, certainly the state agencies weren't taking the lead on this. Um, I recognize this is a stopgap measure. Um, this is not long-term funding. And I also have very serious concerns about uh, the public safety community uh, getting into the treatment options. Their job is enforcement, not treatment. And there needs to be state action somewhere, somehow, that puts the infrastructure in place to allow treatment. Now, referrals are great, but uh, I don't think it's the purview of the police department to be providing uh, 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 treatment options. I think it's necessary. We, we're forced to do this now because there's no other alternative, and I commend the group for stepping up and doing that, but this needs to be a stopgap measure across the board. Uh, and I think we really got to put pressure on our state legislators as a community and as a body to help solve this problem. Because, uh, you know, yes, we're not paying for this with monetary uh, resources, but it's staff time. It's, it's uh, you know, there's clearly a need there. Um, I think we can be part of the solution, but we're not the solution. So I certainly will support this. I, I appreciate their, their efforts. I think they've been way above and beyond. Um, we're, I, I think we, as a community, um, it's the compassionate and the right thing to do, and I'm proud that we're doing it, but it's not long-term. It can't be long-term. Just to be clear for those at home, we're not providing any, certainly any treatment, much less recommendations uh, for treatment. We're essentially an intake procedure. We're, we're a port in the storm, if you will, and we're partnering folks up that need help uh, with uh, trained substance abuse professionals who are prescribing the best course of action for them. Um, and you're exactly right that we, this is not sustainable in the current configuration. Other comments? As 
the other thing was the reason there are no treatment facilities that are willing to take these patients is because these patients are not insured. Uh, and so that if you wanted to take one particular step here, you would have your legislators uh, adopt the Medicaid expansion opportunity that is available to every state in the country under the ACA. Uh, and that, that would provide uh, funds to uh, uh, insurance funds through the Medicaid program to allow these people to get help. To your point, 69% uh, of those that we have, have passed through our doors uh, lack insurance or other financial resources. Um, so I have a, one question. Um, typically I've seen with most uh, block grants or grants is that there's some type of matching fund requirement. Um, this does not have that requirement, correct? I think there are some uh, in-kind uh, contributions. Patrick Grover can speak to them. Uh, there's no financial outlay, but I think we're able to show local match by way of in-kind uh, in -kind effort. Yeah. The requirement, uh, good evening. Good evening. The requirement for match on this grant is 20%, and we do have that, uh, the funds available at this time uh, from other donations, and we would use those funds <coughs> if we're successful. This is uh, council approval to apply for the grant. This isn't council approval to accept the grant. I apologize in past situations uh, in other grants, this is the first time I've applied for this one. In other ones, usually the approval is to accept or not accept the grant. So this would just be approval to go ahead with the application um, and we move forward and then be back to, to let you know one way or the other whether we were uh, successful or not. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, uh, personal comments on the issue. Uh, first of all, uh, Chief, to you and your entire staff, this is just an incredible thing that you do. I, I don't think that we could uh, praise you enough and say thank you enough because it's so, so important. I work in a community in York County that less than four months ago, I want to say within four months, just in a one week period, they had five deaths based on opioid, and you could probably figure out where I work. And then there's just so much even more even not big heroin, uh, just on the heroin side, let alone anything else. Um, so it's, and they praise how Scarborough runs our program um, as part of the next net through their Rotary and Kiwanis and a few other things. So really appreciate what you've done. Personally, um, I just wanted to understand the financing, um, whether we do it in kind and wh or whether we do it through our own funding. So I personally have no problem allocating funds from our budget if we could do so um, for this particular issue because it's so important uh, to the region and uh, why not uh, make the world a better place. And it, by the way, um, and uh, the chief might not but smile with this one, but I have no problem using the C's asset fund either uh, to fund this rather than buying um, additional equipment and using it directly for what um, it's being acquired from. So I totally support this and hope that you're not only successful, and by the way, wasn't the previous grant you applied for, it was like, it's actually like $100,000 shortfall to really run that program, so this is only taking care of about a third of what they really need to address the issue. So, uh, very much in support of this, very much. Um, any other comments? Not seeing any. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Next item is uh, order number 17-017, act on the request to accept a $500 grant from the Natural Resource Council of Maine for the Food Waste Pilot Program and authorize the town manager to sign a grant document. Um, any public comments regarding the order? Not seeing any, we'll move on. Um, overview from the annex. Quickly by way of an reduction of the energy committee that actually uh, taken some interest in solid waste, waste issues and most recently uh, this council uh, or the past council received uh, a report from them that highlighted the value of getting organics or green waste out of our waste stream and uh, they have uh, gone beyond that and they're now looking at a pilot project in one neighborhood in town of 200 homes uh, off Pleasant Hill Road um, and the idea would be to introduce curbside uh, uh, compost collection. A big part of that is getting good data so we want to be able to measure the sort of solid waste activities or habits before and then after and so this grant will go uh, toward that effort we've partnered with a professor at USM to help provide the oversight to some of that survey and uh, other scientific approaches. And this grant will help defer some of those expenses. And pleasure, any questions for the manager? 
or motions in the council? So I, I did have a question. How, how was the, just curious, how was the neighborhood selected? It was really because of a uh, very passionate person on the committee lived in that neighborhood and um, agreed to be kind of the, the local spokesperson knocking on doors and we really couldn't turn down someone who was a very, would be an advocate for the program. It's also very compact. Um, so it's uh, geographically, it's convenient in that respect as well. Motion from the council? Second. There's a second. Uh, any comments? Not seeing any. Moving the question. All in favor? That is unanimous. Now, there are no non-action items. Uh, moving over to standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. So I'll start with Council Donovan. Uh, Energy Committee uh, uh, met this morning. We talked about the complex uh, pilot program. I think we, it's going to be kicked off in early May uh, with some uh, public meetings uh, 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 and so a lot more information to be able to uh, encourage the neighborhood's support and understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the Ordinance Committee also took up uh, uh, fireworks. Uh, and that will be uh, back on our agenda for the next uh, ordinance committee meeting, uh, which is uh, uh, in March of this year. Uh, and we expect to probably finish our business uh, in the month of March, so that we'll have something back uh, to, uh, to the town council uh, as far as uh, responding to the fireworks concerns. Uh, that's it. Thank you. How's it rolling? Uh, I have none. The weather has wreaked havoc with my uh, <laughs> uh, committee schedule. Excellent. <laughs> Councilor Hayes? Um, simultaneous report, a couple quickly. One, public safety community met. Um, kind of went through, just reviewed all the site visits. The surrounding communities have been really generous in opening their facilities of both the police and fire stations and kind of sharing with us what design things worked, what things didn't work. It's been a great process. A lot of people are participating. We also have selected a consultant had a chance to meet them. They kind of came to our meeting last week, so that process is moving forward. Um, an update from the Coastal Water and, and Harbor Advisory Committee. They've been doing some work about, again, a, a similar type issue of parking and some of the issues around parking down at the uh, Pine Point Co-op. They've actually put together kind of a three-phase plan. I think they've actually sat down with the town manager and kind of went through their proposals. And I think, maybe speaking of the term, but you thought, Many of the things they suggested sh should be easily accommodated, and they're really hoping that that will make it much clearer down there where the commercial folks can park, where recreational users can park. So um, that process is underway. I think, Tom, you said the work could be done by early spring or late spring, I guess. Late the first phase, yeah. 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 Um, and then kind of excitingly on the, the shellfish conservation committee, there was actually, you know, you, you could, some may remember a conversation, spirited conversation we had around licenses and the health of the clam flats. Um, there's become an opportunity where there's a um, study pro grant possibility that we could actually take a small plot of the flats and make it into kind of a research project for three years that would be funded. Um, kind of a, an agricultural thing, there's interest. The Shellfish Commission is at least interested in applying for that grant. And I think, Tom, again, you've had some conversations, and that may be a real possibility. That will give us, as a council, we'd ask for really trying to get a handle on how the predators are impacting the flats. Apparently, this technology keeps all the predators out of, of the flats, and so you can get a real good read about what the flats could produce versus what's being produced. That would give us an idea. So that, that's probably something that will be coming back. That's kind of in process, and they unanimously approved uh, moving forward on that, which I thought was great. Yeah, just on that point, I expect something before you as soon as your next meeting, just to make sure we are in a position to secure the, the grant funding. But there's there's great interest and enthusiasm, so I'm excited to bring it forward. And similarly to Will, the the, um, the finance committee meeting did not meet because of weather this time, so we'll we'll circle back next time. Thank you. So right. and um, I just want to cover the for chip. Oh, sorry, cover Hi, I know. Uh, so two things, long range planning met, um, we are looking at a comprehensive plan update um, with the consultants. Um, the long range planning would like to try and schedule a joint workshop with the council sometime in April uh, to bring the consultant in and, and discuss you know, actions forward I believe and that, and that kind of stuff. 
Um, hopefully we do that prior to the all committee summit because I think there'll be a lot of uh, um, exchange of information and direction at the all, all um, <coughs> summit as well. So hopefully we'll have a chance to look at that ahead of time and, and see how that's presented. Uh, we also looked at the, <coughs> the Higgins Beach Charter Code audit and that's the, um, the zoning that we looked at that was more visual zoning. I think, <coughs> excuse me, this council adopted that uh, about a year or so ago. Um, They've had an opportunity to review approximately six to eight projects so far that under that zoning um, and do a kind of a check back of what's working, what's not working, um, or what could be improved. And I think we're they're in the process of, of kind of doing a self evaluation at this point to see um, how well that's going and, and what corrections need to be or can be made to that process. Um, that's certainly going to be something moving forward. Um, we also discussed uh, transportation and the land use connection, similar to the workshop that we had here with Maine DOT, actually with the Maine Turnpike Authority, um, just from a very uh, broad perspective of, of what that might entail for Scarborough and, and how that may impact some land usage planning. And I think Dan addressed that in our uh, workshop as well. Uh, some of the things we need to look at is getting some um, resolution, if you will, or at least some, some understanding of how that project's going to move forward and that will impact our long range plan for sure. Uh, appointments met this afternoon. Um, we had um, two, uh, three actions basically, which is here. Um, the committee uh, approved um, for Parks Conservation and Land Board. We approved Rebel Douglas uh, with a term to expire in 2018. Um, and for the senior advisory board, they had three vacancies, um, one full voting member and one and two one, first and second alternates. We had one application for that, uh, former Councilor Jean Marie Caterina. Um, uh, we uh, appointed her with a term to expire in 2018. And then finally, on the Shelfish Conservation Commission, um, we had tabled these uh, reappointments from the last committee, but we decided to move forward with uh, continuing um, with terms to expire, I believe 2019, um, Terry Tuomi and Robert Willett, um, both are up for reapproval. Uh, so I'd like to thank all those people who have stepped forward and volunteered. And um, certainly, um, I have a list of, of vacancies and, and openings to left. Um, I won't take the time to share that now, but um, we're also looking at um, uh, reviewing um, all of the committees basically from Council, uh, Chairman Bayvine was at our last meeting and gave us a spreadsheet of active and, and, and open positions, so I'll be reporting that out certainly at the next meeting as well. Um, for the chair, I just want to mention two things. So uh, for the public at least, um, if you're just joining us uh, a little while ago, we did have a workshop before the meeting, so if you get a chance to watch this again on tape, uh, please uh, go in about an hour earlier. We had a workshop with Peter Mills, the Executive Director of the Maine Turnpike Authority, talking about what is referenced as the Gorm East-West Corridor. Pretty much they're looking at a, a new corridor or at least a new uh, passageway going from Exit 45 through Scarborough out into Gorham um, and other parts. And so uh, please take a look at that. It's going to be something that will be coming forward at the next meeting regarding our support <coughs> um, at the state level and then there will be uh, Hopefully, and this is a longer term uh, project, by the way, it's like five to ten years. Um, and the last piece um, I wanted to mention, I have not forgotten us about goals. Um, we had that first workshop. Um, I just received, or I will be receiving the um, um, one counselor's input tonight. Uh, he's been busy. Um, but um, even with that, I think I know where we're going. Um, my goal is if I have the next meeting is to have a document for you that identifies the three goal statements as well as the metrics. Um, there was some very clear, um, and nothing was unanimous, but there was some very clear um, direction given regarding the metrics in the school statement. So um, I think you'll be very happy with that. But um, my hope is that we bring this up and have an approval of the goals um, at probably the next meeting. And with that, I'll turn it over to the town manager for his report. Two quick things. Uh, just a reminder, the fourth annual community dialogue to the discovery of public schools is March 9th. Uh, five to eight at what worth school cafeteria. For those of you that have not uh, been part of it, uh, you're really missing out. It's, it's a really neat event. They organize it well, uh, and it, it's, a work, it's worthwhile. And the other thing is, uh, I guess we guessed right. 
Uh, Winterfest was rescheduled till this weekend, and it looks as though we'll be in good shape. So Saturday, uh, basically starting from noon until dusk, where there'll, there'll be fireworks uh, at the conclusion, but there'll be uh, contest events and ongoing events throughout the entire afternoon. And at this point, weather looks uh, very promising. And we're successful in that. Excellent. Uh, moving on to council member comments, Councilor Chiazzo. Uh So. I uh, attended the um, fuel rally at the Oak Hill Fire Station. Uh, I saw uh, a council of members there, and I'm not sure. If I, I got there fairly late, so I apologize if other council members were there. I think it's you there. Yeah, there well, I'm sorry. Well, I missed you on that one. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, that's great. I, I did. I, I showed up at the very last at the very last minute, so I apologize. I thought it went longer than it actually did. I thought it was a four-hour event, not a two-hour event. Um, yeah. Very positive things. Um, they basically raised uh, 10, 000, uh, over $10,000 in two hours. Um, they continue to take uh, donations for sure, and in front of each counselor is a Clint bag. Um, I think that's you know, uh, certainly something that I, I would encourage us to contribute with as well. It's a couple of nickels here and there, but it all makes a, a huge impact. Um, they're to up now to over 17,000. Um, so uh, basically, um, that's due to very um, generous matching grants from Classic Eyewear, who <coughs> gave a $2,500 matching grant, as well as uh, local citizen Eddie Wooden, who also gave a $2,500 matching grant. Uh, so I, I thank both of them for their immense generosity. Um, I'm going to list as partners. I'm going to go very quickly, because, but I do think they all should get a shout out because it's a hugely successful program. Uh, Scarborough Fire and Public Safety Departments, uh, the Public Library, Pine Point Ladies Auxiliary, Scarborough Marsh Audubon Center, Buy Local, uh, Daisy Girl Scouts, Boy Scout Troop Number 47, who continues to give out clink bags to the community. They're looking to hopefully sell 100 clink bags uh, for the benefit of the program, so hopefully this will help add to their total from our perspective. Wooden Company, Saco Bitterford Savings, Volunteers and Police Service, Town of Scarborough, Scarborough Rotary Club, Scarborough Lions, Scarborough Kiwanis Club, Sedco, and Project Grace. And to put it into perspective, um, $15,000 supports about 60 helps of uh, 100 gallons of fuel, propane, K1 oil, or wood. So, um, and, you know, I think that's a real testament to the generosity of this community and also the need that's out there. So, hopefully, we continue to do that. And I, I, I thank uh, um, certainly Project Grace and Steffi for, for, for leading that effort and, and, and the town for participating. She did want to shout out to the town employees as well. Um, I believe they raised about $1,100 um, from Clink, and they actually uh, pay a dollar to wear jeans to work. So um, I don't know if that's a trend we want to start. I'd be happy to put a collection jar out. Um, so we'll, we'll go from there. So, but but great great turnout. Um, you know, uh, a lot of smiling faces, and certainly helps a lot of people. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I'm all set. Yeah. Councilor Rowan. Uh, yeah. So um, I think. If we're going to put out the collection jar for jeans to count council meetings, I'm probably in the rears. Uh, <laughs> 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 but I'm, I'm good for it. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Rachel Cummings of the Gore Middle School for a very thoughtful letter that she sent us on um, about litter on the uh, on the beach. Um, I also spoke last time about uh, really wanting to have a multicultural and diversity committee, and I was corrected to say that now the term is intercultural and diversity. Um, so I'm still very interested in, in establishing one of those. Um, and then lastly, there has um, been some discussion um, in, the, um, in the community about placing a uh, monument toward the Battle of Moore Brook, uh, which was down on Black Point, uh, was battle for on June 29th of 1677. Uh, oh, and yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so there will, if you hear anything about it, that's what's going on, and there will probably be some discussion about where that will be located. Uh, and recently, we really had a chance to uh, to work with our two newest uh, administrators here at Town Hall, uh, Kerry Stroud, uh, uh, working on behalf of the Energy Committee. Uh, we have a streetlight proposal that uh, she has done some terrific analysis work and data collection that we saw today at the Energy Committee, uh, the compost pilot program, uh, coordinating with uh, Mike Shaw, and Mike and uh, Carrie and I met uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, on that, it was, uh, it's really going well. 
uh, and it just shows you the, the value of the committee structure is all volunteer, but to have a staff member with professional expertise between meetings advances things so tremendously. Uh, and uh, Larissa Crockett, our new assistant town manager, uh, the ordinance committee has coming up uh, some signage issues. There's a U.S. Supreme Court case that makes uh, uh, a lot of sign ordinances uh, illegal. Uh, and so she was. She did some good work with the MMA uh, legal staff to get it clear in my mind as to as to what the legal standard was. That's going to help when this comes up. Uh, I think at the next uh, ordinance committee meeting. So uh, uh, both both people are proving to be very very capable, intelligent, thoughtful. They seem to know how to get things done. So I was impressed. Thank you. Um, just a couple of items. First, um, um, I can't remember where. Um, I think this was on Mr. Maroon's um, business sign, um, and I always, I think it's wonderful because he advertises, and that is, this is the time of year which I hope everyone is adopting a hydrant um, and helping out our public safety uh, personnel in uh, identifying specifically with the amount of snow. It's a pretty easy afternoon year snowplow guy or gal to just simply take a couple of swipes and move that snow, so I hope everyone does that in their neighborhood um, and helps them out. Um, I also wanted to thank Public Works and Public Safety for a job, um, just absolutely incredible job of the weekend and I'm sure for this evening as well. Um, this is the first year I can tell you I didn't get any calls about um, broken mailboxes. I'm sure there might have been a few, but we must be handling it, we must be handling it very well um, because uh, Public Works does take care of that. Uh, so thank you to everyone who's been working and done a, they're doing a great job. Um, Wanted to mention um, absentee ballots are still um, available at Town Hall until when is this? Thursday of next week. So um, if you would like to vote absentee, you have until Thursday of next week, which is the 23rd, we believe. So uh, please come in and vote. It is very important, even though there is only one item on the ballot. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, just as a reminder, I believe I've mentioned this before, I've actually been invited to speak as council chair um, to speak at the Kiwanis meeting on March 3rd. Um, I'm taking an abbreviated uh, version of the manager's presentation on the state of our town and kind of working with that um, and, and conforming it to a, a, a few, um, about 15 minutes. So just want you to know, and I'll share that with you once I have the presentation um, ready. I um, wanted to mention um, also the, um, you know, thanks Deputy Cox and, and Project Grace and the fuel, uh, the fuel rally. It just you know, we constantly hear about um, we're becoming a city and we're just and we're an oversized big town. But when you go to these uh, type of events, you realize just how awesome Scarborough is and how connected and um, how much everybody really does care about the community and care about others. And um, it's just it was just a wonderful success. And if someone can re actually, Mr. Kiyazu, since um, maybe you can help me, I have uh, 25 bags of wood pellets that I can donate or that can be donated. So if you can remind me, I'll. Um, maybe you can help me get in touch with Stephanie on that uh, particular issue. Um, and then, you know, in closing, I just want to thank um, one of the things that I've been working on is that I was putting together a package of all of our boards and committees and who's on there. There's 25 different committees that we have um, throughout the town that are associated with government um, in which there's at least five members active, if not seven. A couple have nine, um, let alone including de um, alternates. So you do the math, you know, just five alone, you know, it's 125 volunteers. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the council members as well because, it, you know, we're a liaison to multiple committees and the amount of work that we're doing and the work that's getting done is just absolutely incredible. And I want to thank the volunteers um, as well. We had a member of our transportation committee here earlier that didn't get a chance to speak, but just thank them for the work that there's a lot of work getting done. Um, and there's going to be a lot more. Um, one of our goals um, is around communications and, and so there is a very heavy goal um, that we need to drive forward and, and make sure that we achieve because we're all responsible for being successful. And um, with that, I would accept the motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor.